Hello again, baseball fans, and welcome into the 20th episode of Ducks on the Pod. Here on September 20th, actually. Great to have you along once again. I'm your host, Mitch Gatsky. Thanks so much for joining me. Since the last time we spoke, the Cleveland Indians clinched the AL Central, and the Houston Astros clinched the AL West. So congratulations to you if you're a fan of either of those teams. And best of luck as you watch your team battle against the other to try and figure out who's going to end up with the top spot in the AL in this last week and a half of the season here. It's coming down to the wire with that race as well as a few others. We'll get into those later. But first, I want to share with you some words from the baseball wise that I heard this past week. The problem is, I don't know if I trust him to throw three strikes before he throws four balls. That was Bob Brenly on one of the D-backs new call-ups out of the bullpen. And yeah, that's an issue in baseball. You're going to want to throw three strikes before you throw four balls if you're the pitcher. Possibly the best part about the Arizona Diamondbacks being so good this year is having a legitimate reason to tune into their broadcast every night. Steve Berthume and Bob Brenly put on a great show. You might remember Berthume from his time at ESPN as a sports center anchor and host of Baseball Tonight. Brenly, you should remember, was the skipper of the 2001 Diamondbacks team that won the World Series. So if you have MLB.TV Premium, I highly recommend turning on a Diamondbacks game and checking these guys out. Now, Hamilton Porter, get us started. On Tuesday night, it became official. 2017 now has the most homers ever in a Major League Baseball season. And they've been playing baseball for a very long time, so this is quite impressive. There's also been more home runs hit by rookies in this season than in any before. Nine rookies with 20 or more home runs. There are two with at least 18. Uh, The previous high for rookies with 20 or more homers was six, and that was tied just last year. Some rookies are actually showing increased power in their jump to the majors, which is strange. It's not something that we're used to seeing at all. Uh, You would expect a guy coming up from the lower levels to struggle, especially in the power department. But we've seen a lot of guys come up to the majors this year and actually hit more home, home runs. It's been very fun to watch. It doesn't really matter what you call them, home runs, homers, dingers, bombs, big flies, long balls, taters. Just stop trying to explain what we're watching and just enjoy it. We've got Giancarlo Stanton chasing 60, Aaron Judge chasing Mark McGuire's rookie record of 49, and Cody Bellinger's next homer will set the NL rookie record. Man, what a time to be a fan. Tuesday night also saw CC Sabathia move to 18th on the all-time strikeouts leaderboard. And I hadn't realized he had that many. So I got to thinking about it. Is CC a Hall of Famer? I posted the Twitter poll and the results 15 to 9 in favor of him ending up in the hall. With 20 more strikeouts, he will move to 17th over Jim Bunning. And another couple solid seasons, we'll see him get to 3,000, which is obviously a monumental accomplishment for any pitcher. Regardless of that, he's going to finish his career third among lefties, which shocked me to find out. That, too, will surely be a big feather in his cap. The magical run that he went on during the second half of the 2008 season makes me want to say, yes, he will get in. He was traded from Cleveland to Milwaukee on July 7th of that year with a 6-8 and eight record at that point. He finished 17-10. and 10. He made 17 starts for the Brew Crew. Seven of them were complete games. Three were shutouts. He posted a 1-6-5 ERA in 130 and two-thirds innings. He failed to go six innings just once, surrendered more than three earned runs just once, He went on three days rest in his final three starts of the season, trying to pitch the Brewers into the playoffs. He wanted to be the one with the ball in his hand. He was. I mean, talk about putting the team on your back. I'm not sure we'll ever see something so remarkable ever again. Sabathia was as dominant as a pitcher can be over that three-month period. 
But beyond that, I'm not so sure. Remember, his only postseason start that year against the eventual world champion Phillies did not go well. In the offseason, of course, he signed with the Yankees, fat contract. In return, he gave them 19 wins and an ace to lean on on their way to a World Series title. Put up three more great seasons after that, and then he started getting smacked around. Got injured in 2014. That was basically a lost season. The last two years haven't gone well either, and it seemed like Sabathia was done being a reliable starter. But this year, he's really turned that around, and it's a huge reason why the Yankees are closing in on a postseason bid. He's totally reinvented himself, going from a fireballer to much more of a touch-and-feel, finesse type of guy. He had that rocky road in his mid-30s, but it looks like he's got it figured out this year. It's great to see a pitcher working his way up the all-time ranks in this era of offensive explosion. And if he gets to 3,000 strikeouts, which is entirely possible, his candidacy will be undeniable. I'm rooting for him. With the Cubs finally putting a little distance between themselves and their challengers in the NL Central, the closest division race is now the AL East, where the Red Sox are just two and a half games ahead of the Yankees as we stand here on early Wednesday evening. The Sox are in Cincinnati this weekend, and so am I. Thanks to my buddy Chase for the tickets, we'll be at Great American Ballpark Saturday and Sunday. So if you're in the Queen City over the weekend, give us a shout. Next week, I'll have some notes on the overall experience at Great American. I will say this. It's been one of my favorite parks that I've been to. Uh, Just something about that river in the background just gets me. Anyway, the Yanks just got done sweeping the Twins out of town this afternoon, so they're safely situated in the first wildcard spot. And now they can comfortably turn their attention to trying to catch the Red Sox, who've done a great job maintaining their lead here in the second half over the Yankees, keeping them at a distance. Looking at the remaining schedules, this thing is going to come right down to the very end. Boston is in Cincy for three this weekend. Then they head home for three against the Blue Jays and finish with an amazingly well-placed four-game set against the Astros. Wow. Houston won't be holding back at all since they now trail the Tribe for the top spot in the AL. Boston, obviously, will be fighting to stay out of that one-game wildcard playoff. New York, meanwhile, will see the Jays for three this weekend just before they head to Boston. And the Yanks finish at home as well. There's a makeup date with the Royals on Monday afternoon, three games against the Rays, and then three more against the Jays to close out. On paper, the schedule is clearly in the Bombers' favor. Baseball, thankfully, is not played on paper. And you got to believe that the Jays and Rays would love to play spoiler in the last week of the season. It's too bad that they don't play each other in the final two weeks here. But hey, what more could you ask for out of the AL East race than a Red Sox-Yankees photo finish? All right, baseball fans. So last week I gave you my reasons why Jose Ramirez is my AL MVP this season. And that would be quite a surprise when you think about where he stacked up at the beginning of the season. But there are many more examples of unlikely MVP award winners. And this week we shift focus to the NL. And I'll start by saying that there are a lot of worthy candidates in the senior circuit this season. Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Charlie Blackman, Giancarlo Stanton, Joey Votto. And there are still many more out there who would be strong candidates in other less sensational seasons. We know this one thing about baseball. It is a game full of unwritten rules. You hit our guy, we hit yours. You don't steal when your team's up 10 runs. You don't stand there and admire your solo shot when your team is still down 13 to four in the eighth inning. And you never, ever, ever, Give the MVP award to a guy who played on a team that didn't qualify for the postseason. Baseball gods forbid that happened. We could never hand out the award again after it had been so tainted. The list of players to win a league MVP while playing on a losing team is very short. A-Rod did it on the 2003 Rangers. Cal Ripken in 1991 with the Orioles. 
It hasn't been done in the NL since Andre Dawson pulled it off for the 87 Cubs. And Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks, did it in back-to-back seasons in 1958 and 59. Now, I hate cliches, but rules, even the unwritten ones, really are made to be broken. Especially when you have a guy doing what Joey Votto has been doing this summer. He's played every single game for the Cincinnati Reds this year. He's one of six players with 100 runs scored. He's got 30 doubles. He's tied with Blackman and Goldschmidt with 35 homers. That's one ahead of Arenado. He is four RBI away from 100. He has drawn 127 walks while striking out just 75 times. That's a ratio that's unheard of in today's game outside of Votto himself. He's even swiped five bags and legged out a triple just for good measure. He has reached base 299 times via hit, walk, or hit by pitch for crying out loud. He's hitting at a 317 clip and slugging 581. Those are top notch numbers, but the true brilliance of Votto's 2017 season is his 454 on base percentage. That ratio is both mind boggling and a bit historic. In the past 12 years, only four hitters who qualified for the batting title have gotten on base in 45% of their plate appearances. Votto and Bryce Harper did it in 2015. Chipper Jones and Albert Pujols did it back in 2008. And that's it. Go back any further and you get into Barry Bonds territory where you're just getting intentionally walked as if all you had to do was point to first. I wonder how many more he would have gotten under the new rule. Anyway, no one comes close to stacking up to Votto this year in the on-base department. Harper is the closest at 419, and he's played 45 fewer games. Now let me make myself clear. Paul Goldschmidt is going to win the award. He's been marvelous all the way around, and Arizona is the surprise team of the year. He deserves it, but so does Votto. Arnauto and Blackman had the Coors curse working against them, and they're also on the same team, which hurts their candidacy. Stanton has been real streaky, hot and cold like crazy. Votto, of course, is stuck on a last place ball club. But that is literally the only reason you can come up with why you wouldn't give it to him. And that's not good enough. Not for me, at least. Not when Votto is out here performing like the modern day Ted Williams. So let's break one of baseball's stupidest unwritten rules and give Joey Votto what he deserves for his work this season, a National League MVP award. Just a couple more quick things before I get out of here. The Cubs and Brewers are meeting up for all the NL Central Marbles this weekend. And the Cubs, of course, came out and scored 49 runs in the six games they've played since I talked last week about their offense scuffling this month. Well, now they've won seven in a row. They swept the cards out of town over the weekend and now lead them by six and the Brewers by three and a half. But the Brewers' no-name pitching staff just keeps getting the job done. And if they can keep it going this weekend, it might be just enough to squeak their way past the defending champs and into an NL Central crown. Keep an eye on that series. It's a four-game set starting on Thursday at Miller Park. And with the race still so close, this is basically going to determine who wins that NL Central. Keep an eye on it. And I sign off this week with a reminder that even when you're in last place, you can still have fun playing baseball. Johnny Cueto was one of the more entertaining players in the game. And Tuesday night, he showed us that everything really is just fun and games when you're on the baseball diamond. Check out that video. Thanks so much for tuning in to episode number 20 of Ducks on the Pod. Be sure to check back in next week as we wrap up the regular season. I got a couple special things for you. And then, of course, we get ready for October baseball. Oh, yeah. It's almost that time. Thanks again for listening. I'm your host, Mitch Gatsky, reminding you the three keeps of baseball. Keep your glove on the dirt, your bat off your shoulder, and always keep your eye on the ball. Back, 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 gone.